Um, as I prepared for the message this week, it crossed my mind how thankful I am, and maybe you can share with me in this, um, that social media did not exist when I was a teenager. Are you with me on this? So often, I'm so thankful that I don't have that kind of record of my life as a teen. First of all, I'm glad that there is somewhat limited photographic evidence of what I even looked like as a teenager. And secondly, just the thought of the things that I would have felt compelled to share that were jokes or even foolish things that I thought were true, man, I shudder to think of the things that I would have posted as a middle and high school student. And then thirdly, having 15 years in student ministry, I have seen firsthand the things that students and young people do tend to post and the, the pictures and the trends and all the different things that happen on social media. And I have so often thought to myself, you're going to regret that when you're older. You guys with me on this? And that's not even to mention the reality that the internet has really kind of become, in some ways, a little bit of a dark place with terrible people who say terrible things. I mean, just dive into the comments section on virtually any post on any site and you will see the worst of people saying the worst of things, right? It's where arguments are started. It's where internet trolls are born. Reading the comments section of pretty much anything will illustrate the truth of Proverbs chapter 18, verse 6, which says this, one of my favorite Proverbs. A fool's lips walk into a fight and his mouth invites a beating. <laughs> we get that, right? We have seen the lips of the foolish. We have seen the words that comes from those who want to start fights, and in many ways, their lips invite a beating. The anonymity of the internet has made people forget this truth. And there are a lot of people out there on the internet that through their words would be inviting a beating if they were saying those things in person, right? Now, for all those reasons and many more, I think that we can agree that we should be motivated to choose carefully what we say and especially what we post. Well, the internet may have in some ways diminished the quality of public discourse, just like inflation diminishes the quality and value of the dollar. It also exists as a glaring example of the power and importance of our words. And today, as we continue in our basic instruction series, looking at the book of Proverbs, we're looking at the topic of our words, our speech. We've discussed how Solomon wrote these things in what's a particular style of biblical literature called wisdom literature, right? He wrote these things in short statements to communicate big truths in the light of what we know about God. How then should we live? That's what Proverbs is all about. If we understand that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, that means that we're acknowledging that God has made and designed the world to work in such a way that if we follow the way that he has designed it, if we do what pleases God, then we should understand that we should receive the best results. That's what this wisdom literature is about. That's what this wisdom literature is like. It's basically just giving us basic instructions on how we should live. Our mouths, our tongues, and our speech, the words that we choose to say or not to say, that topic comes up 30 times at least in the book of Proverbs. Now that gives us a pretty good indication that this is something that we should pay close attention to, right? So this morning, we're going to go through several of those Proverbs, often pairing them with New Testament texts that go along with them so that we can best apply wisdom from God and how we should handle the way that we speak. So let's begin with looking at a really good one. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21 says this, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruits. Sounds pretty serious, doesn't it? Death and life are in the power of our tongues. Our words carry weight and power. The things we say can uniquely and powerfully do damage or bring healing. So one basic idea that we can draw from this basic proverb this morning, the first blank on your sheet if you're following along and filling those in, is that the words we speak matter. I know this is very simple, but if our tongues hold the power of life and death, then we should be careful in the way that we use them. We should know that our words matter. In an age in which virtually everyone has a public platform, when everything that is posted is kept as public record, and when more than ever our speech is scrutinized and often even vilified, I believe we know that this is true. Our words have power. Our speech matters. Death 
and life are in the power of our tongues. And the obvious implication just from reading that proverb is that we should want to be, we should desire to be people that speak words of life and not death. Solomon's understanding of wisdom when it comes to the tongue, the idea is that wise people choose to speak wisely, which is why he says in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 24, it says, put away from you crooked speech and put devious talk far from you. It's a pretty solid example of what it means to understand that death and life are in the power of our words. There will certainly be times, and I think that we all know this, that we will be tempted toward dishonesty. We may feel the need in our conversations to skirt issues or to avoid conflict or to appear correct or even just to sound smart by using, crook by using crooked and deceitful speech. But as the proverb makes clear, this should not be. Just as the proverbs themselves are generally straightforward and very clear summations of wisdom, that also should be the way that we speak. We should be people of honesty and truth, not deceit and devious talk. One form of speech is positive, it's true, it's who God desires us to be, and the other is negative, doing damage and harming others and ourselves. Living in wisdom and the knowledge of God means acknowledging what we know about the power of our words, that our words carry the power of death and life. The way we speak matters. Our words cannot be thrown around as if they do not have power. They have the power of life and death. Consider the words of James in the New Testament. It's a letter in the New Testament that we read recently in our New Testament reading program. James chapter 3, verse 5 to 6 says this, So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. It seems to me that James understood the truth of this proverb really well, right? And when I read that, I feel like I get a little bit of an indication that James is speaking from some sort of deep personal experience. James had grown to understand that our tongues are powerful. The words we say matter. Our words are able to, as he said, set fire to the entire course of life. And in our modern world of Twitter and 24-hour news cycles and podcasts and texting and all sorts of other ways that we have to communicate our thoughts and feelings and ideas, it is easy to forget that our words actually do matter. The way we speak matters. Our tongues are a fire and not just when speaking face to face to other people. And many people, by the abundance of their words, are walking around like little pyromaniacs spewing that fire all over anyone who will hear. And that should not be us. For a Christian, living in the light of the wisdom of Proverbs, as well as the redeeming grace of Jesus, this should not be. Christians especially should stand out in society as most careful with our words and with our speech. In Ephesians chapter 5, which we opened our service with today, Paul is basically laying out for these Ephesian believers, these followers of Jesus, the idea that there should be a distinction between who they were in their sin before and who they are presently in Christ. He lays out a lot of different examples throughout that chapter to say, this is what you'll be tempted to be like. This is the, the old self, and here we are telling you what the new self is, the way that you should appear as a follower of Jesus. And this is what he says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 4. He says, Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead, let there be thanksgiving. You can see the idea here, right? This proverb continues to echo throughout the New Testament. Our words matter. For those who are reconciled to God through Christ, there should be a fundamental difference in us, all the way down to the way that we speak. Because we're growing to understand the God-given wisdom that our words have the power of life and death, we then should strive to use them accordingly. Filthiness, he says, foolish talk and crude joking are part of the old self. That is who we were. But in Christ, we understand that we are new creations. Instead of speaking in those ways which cause damage and harm, 
we instead replace that speech with thankfulness. We speak what is true and good. And there are so many opportunities throughout any given week for us to use words that are unkind or harmful. It is super easy to get involved in something like gossip. It can feel really good sometimes to release your personal frustration by saying something mean. There's nothing quite like getting a really good laugh from an inappropriate joke. We know that temptation. Sometimes you really just feel compelled to give someone who was rude to you a piece of your mind. Or consider this even, how often are you in your thoughts about yourself speaking harmful and untrue things to yourself in these ways? That is not who we are meant to be. In what we call our sanctification, we are being transformed into the likeness of Christ, and that should be reflected in what we desire to speak. A big part of being a believer in Christ who seeks to follow after Jesus and who understands that we are not only freed from our sin in eternity, but also called on a mission to live free of sin now, we should live with this very important word from Ephesians chapter 5, verse 4 in mind. And that important word is this, instead. I can be fully aware of the things that I would want to say. I can be fully aware of my own sinfulness, my own tendencies to speak foolishness or to say crude jokes or to, to speak anger. But I should also be aware of, in my Christian walk, the instead. Following after Jesus and being transformed by him means that I recognize those tendencies for what they are and I consciously think instead. Instead of harsh words or frustration or anger or gossip or malice or filthiness or foolishness, instead, I choose thanksgiving and purity and goodness and encouragement and kindness and sometimes even silence. Applying this wisdom from Proverbs, especially in the light of the gospel, which transforms us, means that we should constantly be growing toward choosing the instead. Now Solomon seems to have understood this, and in a couple of his Proverbs, he communicates one of those instead options very clearly. Look with me at Proverbs chapter 10, verse 19. He says this, When words are many, transgression is not lacking, but whoever restrains his lips is prudent. You can see the idea there, right? When we speak a whole lot, we're leading ourselves into trouble, but instead we can choose to restrain our lips. So the point here is simple. If you're following along on your sheet, the next blank is this. Choosing not to speak is often wise. When we feel an abundance of words coming on, when we've got the perfect rant, when we've got the perfect takedown to really bring that person down a notch, we should very often consider to instead choose to restrain our lips, to choose silence. One of my favorite comedians is a guy named Mike Birbiglia. I encourage you to look him up sometime. He keeps it relatively clean. Um, he tells a story of a time when he was moving a new bed into his New York apartment. And I wanted to share this clip with you. Hopefully it'll work in a way that you can hear it. Um, but yeah, let's, let's see what Mike Birbiglia has to say. But I feel very fortunate to be a comedian and I appreciate you guys coming to this show, you know, because if you weren't here, then I wouldn't get to be, you know, be a comedian. Or, uh, you know, I'd be asleep at a job somewhere. <laughs> But uh, over the years, I've, I've had some, uh, some weird shows. Sometimes people see you at, a, at like a comedy club or a college or something, and they'll, they'll be like, this, this is great. Like, this is really funny. We should have this in our conference room, like in the fluorescent lights with Diet Coke, you know? And I'm like, that is not a good idea, but I'll do it. <laughs> But I'll tell you about the worst situation that I was ever, ever. And I have a habit of making awkward situations even more awkward. 
I always give this example, but a few years ago, I was moving a new bed into my apartment, and this woman who lived in the building opened the front door for me with her key, right? And she said, I'm not worried because a rapist wouldn't have a bed like that. <laughs> That's how she started the conversation. Now, what I should have said was nothing. <laughs> What I did say was, you'd be surprised. And there's nothing you can say after that. It was like... You get the idea, right? Sorry, it was supposed to queue up right there in the first place, but that's the idea, right? What I should have said was nothing. <laughs> that line pops up in my mind very often. In fact, I kind of teach it to my kids in a way. I tell them what you should have said was nothing. That's precisely the wisdom being communicated here in Proverbs. When words are many, transgression is not lacking, but whoever restrains his lips is prudent. We can avoid a lot of pain and trouble and difficulty if we could learn to be silent sometimes. Which is why Solomon also explains in Proverbs chapter 21, verse 23, he says, whoever keeps his mouth and his tongue keeps himself out of trouble. If you were to ask your kids or your grandkids, what is the thing that gets you in the most trouble? Or if you were to ask yourself as a kid or a teenager, what was the thing in your life that got you in the most trouble? The most common answer that I hear from people is my mouth, right? The way that I speak back to my parents, the way your kids speak back to you is probably one of the prime ways that they get into the most trouble. Phrases like, watch your mouth, or don't speak to me that way, have echoed through houses and homes for generation upon generation because we see in our wisdom of adulthood the degree to which our mouths can get us into trouble. And it is good and right for parents to instill this wisdom in their kids. Now, a, general, a generation of young people who lack this knowledge, as we see fairly clearly in our culture, has no lack of transgression. They lack prudence, and they suffer a great deal of trouble as a result. Consider the example of Jesus in the New Testament. As we talked about the first week as we began studying Proverbs, Jesus is the personal embodiment of the wisdom of God. And while we can certainly read in the Gospels and understand that Jesus was able to use the power of his tongue for the glory of God to give life to many, I think Jesus also demonstrated that he clearly knew when to keep silent. I think particularly about the events leading up to Jesus' crucifixion. You can imagine the, the lunacy of this, that Jesus, who the Bible tells us holds all creation together, was being mocked and beaten and tortured by the creation that he gives the very breath of life to. He had every opportunity to inflict justice and revenge upon these people. The wind and the waves obey the sound of his voice, and yet... Because of who he is, because he understood wisdom, and because he understood what his role was in achieving salvation for many, Jesus chose silence. You've probably heard the prophecy of Isaiah 53, verse 7, that says, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Now, if Jesus can choose silence in the midst of such suffering and torment, then surely we should begin to learn to follow his example by being careful to control our tongues. But wise Christians should understand, and I want you to understand, that this is not just a matter of self-control. It isn't just about bottling up the anger and the hurt and the pain that you have inside. It's not about choking back what you would really love to say. No, as I mentioned before, for wise Christians, this is an issue of transformation. It's about a changing desire in us to live and speak or not speak in a way that pleases God. Not because we must, not because it's legalism, not because we must follow all these rules set before us in the Bible, but because we understand and are growing to develop in our sanctification. That our desires are shifting and changing. That God is transforming us into the likeness of Christ by faith. Look at Proverbs chapter 10 verses 31 to 32. It says this. 
The mouth of the righteous brings forth wisdom, but the perverse tongue will be cut off. The, writ, the lips of the righteous know what is acceptable, but the mouth of the wicked what is perverse. You can see here in this proverb the idea that the righteous are wise people, people who are seeking to live in obedience to God and walk in his design and his ways. Those people will naturally begin to speak what is good. They will speak wisdom. It says the lips of the righteous know what is acceptable. Growing in wisdom should mean that there should be less and less of an inner conflict in us when it comes to these matters. There should be less and less of a fight. Sure, there's going to be a fight sometimes, but as we grow in Christ, as he continues to transform our hearts, it should become more and more natural for us to choose silence. In fact, those, those mean words, those hurtful words, should be fewer and further between. We should desire not to hurt people with our words, not to tear people down, but instead to build one another up. We should know more and more what is acceptable. We should know what is wise and choose to speak or not speak when it's appropriate. Because here's the biblical truth. The next blank on your sheet is this. Our speech reveals our true desires and intentions. Jesus himself explains this idea in Luke chapter 6, verse 45. He says this, The good person, out of the good treasure of his heart, produces good. And the evil person, out of his evil treasures, produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Other translations say, from out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. We should know and understand this to be true. So if you find yourself constantly in this conflict, even if you're desiring to do good, but you're constantly thinking of the next mean thing to say or the next hurtful thing to say or the next way to really put your kids in their place or if you're struggling with staying silent because there's a lot of other things that you would rather put in there, what I would say is this. Don't just fix the behavior. Examine the heart. If those things are the things that you find welling up inside of you, then the problem is inside. It's not just a tongue control problem. It is a heart transformation problem. Dr. Paul Tripp tells a story of when he was a kid and he went to family reunions. He tells of one particular family reunion that he went to in which one of his uncles gets super drunk and starts saying all kinds of mean things and inappropriate things, particularly about a younger female family member. And very wisely and quickly, his mother gathered up him and his brother and took them out of the family reunion and put them in the car. And she said something to them that, he, that really stuck with him. And I think it's important. She said this. Boys, I want you to understand this one thing. He didn't say anything that wasn't already inside him. That's an important truth. Out of the abundance of our hearts, our mouths speak. It's easy to blame alcohol or even our mood sometimes for hurtful things that we say. But this woman knew the truth. It is out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. Our words very often reveal the true desire and intentions of our hearts. For the Christian, as I keep returning to, as we've mentioned already, our goal is transformation from the inside out. If we have repented of our sins and chosen to follow Jesus, to trust in the finished work of Jesus on the cross, then we are made new. Our hearts are being transformed into his likeness. And that is the truth that should more and more often be welling up inside of us. Consider Proverbs chapter 12, verse 18. It says this. There is one whose rash words are like sword thrusts, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Indeed, our words have the power of life and death. The way that we speak matters, and it's often wise for us to remain silent. But we also can't forget that if we're redeemed by Jesus, if we have experienced his grace and forgiveness, if we are being transformed into his likeness, then our heart should begin to absolutely overflow with the truth of the healing that we have received. In a world in which so many people use their words like sword thrusts to hurt other people, those who follow Jesus, who understand this wisdom, should know that we can speak the words that bring healing. 
When we read, as we did in our very first Proverbs day, that our words have the power of life and death, it's easy to gravitate towards the death part. It's easy, easy to read that proverb and say, well, here are the things that I need to correct. I need to stop doing this, this, and this. I need to stop speaking in these ways. This is what I want you to do this morning. I want you to think about those things, but also more than that, focus on this. What words do you need to speak? What words can you speak to other people in your life that bring healing? In what ways can you begin to push yourself to speak words that actually bring life? We don't want to focus just on the death part, not just on the fundamentalist stuff that we don't want to do. We want to focus on this. We are sent on a mission by Jesus who is transforming our hearts. And as he does, our hearts should begin to overflow more and more the goodness of his gospel. This is the last blank on your sheet. I want you to understand this. As much as possible, we should seek to overflow the goodness of the gospel in our speech. The message of Jesus is good and true. It transforms us. And yet far too often we shy away from speaking it. We choose silence over pouring out what is good, what brings healing. We live in a world full of words that seek to damage and subvert and tear down and insult and denigrate and cut like swords. But we have the words that bring healing. We have the message of the gospel that Jesus Christ died to save sinners, sinners like us. Our world desperately needs that message, which is why Paul says in Romans chapter 10, verse 14, How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? Our world needs the message of Jesus. They need to know that there is a good and holy God. They need to understand that our world is broken by sin, that the pain that they experience in the world is the consequence of the sin of all people, including their own sin. These people need to understand that our good and holy God sent his son to live perfectly among us without sin and yet offer himself up as our sacrifice. People need to see and understand that the only way to find true healing in this world is to turn to the one who suffered the wrath of God for the sin of mankind and rose again so that we might be rescued and saved. They need the message of the gospel. And if we are being transformed in his likeness, we should absolutely overflow with the truth of the healing that we have received in him. In a world in which so many people use their words like the thrusts of a sword seeking to inflict damage, those who follow Jesus need to speak the truth of the gospel. People need that message. But how will they call on Jesus if they have not believed? And how will they believe in whom they have never heard? And how will they hear unless you speak the truth? Our words have the power of death but also the power of life. And I encourage you today not only to consider your words carefully, not only to self-correct in ways that your words can be health hurtful, but most of all, to stretch yourself to use your words to communicate the truth of God that you have known through Christ. Think to yourself this morning, what are ways that I specifically this week could try to bring glory to God with my words? Who needs this message of healing? How can I speak this truth into someone's life? Sometimes one really easy step is to, be, to begin to get into the habit of saying, I'm really thankful to God for what he's done in my life. There's usually good things that happen. You're usually around other people when something positive happens. Why not give glory to God in those moments? Why not use those opportunities to point people to the fact that you believe in something bigger than yourself, right? Take those steps to begin to communicate these things. And if you're really nervous about sharing the gospel with other people personally, let me encourage you. The only way you're ever going to feel better and more confident about sharing the gospel with people is by beginning to do it. It's not going to be perfect every time. You're not going to have people coming to the altar at your house. That may not happen immediately, but this is what I'm telling you. You can speak the truth of Jesus. You can lead them to the Bible. There are ways in which you can speak the goodness of the gospel and overflow it from your heart. And it doesn't have to be awkward. It doesn't have to feel forced. It just has to be honest. If Jesus has changed your life, then speak that truth to someone who needs to hear it. Our world needs the truth of the gospel, so we need brave, confident speakers of the words that bring healing, the words of the gospel of Jesus Christ.
Let's pray together as we finish up for today. God, thank you for the message of the gospel. God, we pray in this moment that you would lead us away from the legalism of just trying to monitor the words that we say, and instead that you would transform our hearts fully so that we may overflow the goodness of the message that you have given us. God, where courage is lacking, encourage us to push ourselves. God, help us to not be ashamed of the gospel that we know. Give us boldness in all that we seek to say and do. And God, as we do, I pray that many will come to faith in Jesus Christ by the words spoken by the people in this room. We ask for your continued guidance and for the courage that we need to speak these things. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing together as we close.